Greetings and welcome to Logic. My name is Dan and in this video we'll be looking at how the Romans transported ancient Egyptian obelisks weighing hundreds of tons from Egypt to the Roman capitals of Rome and Constantinople around 2000 years ago. I'll be giving some examples of the largest obelisks transported, explaining how they were moved and erected, also touching on Egyptian influences and refinement, and we'll finish off with some modern examples of how we've moved obelisks in recent centuries. But before we get into that, here is a fact which is some food for thought about Roman capabilities. So the heaviest obelisk that I'm going to be talking about in this video that the Romans transported more than 2,000 kilometers from Egypt over the Mediterranean Sea to Rome was the Lateran obelisk. It weighed around 450 tons, which is over half of the weight of the 800 ton Trilithon stones at Baalbek, which only needed to be transported between 800 and 900 meters, less than one kilometer. So I hope this helps to visualize the capability of the Romans to move huge weights. They had the empire and logistical means for almost any task they wanted to accomplish. Now with that food for thought out of the way, let's get on with the video. Ancient Egyptian obelisks are some of the most enigmatic and grand structures from ancient times. Most were made from either sandstone, basalt or granite, and were carved directly from the bedrock as a single solid monument. The largest obelisks weighed between 200 and 450 tons, some even reported to originally weigh over 500 tons. These monuments dedicated to the sun god were some of the largest single blocks of stone the ancient Egyptians ever transported, and were usually erected in pairs, as two would often stand at temple entrances. With the eventual takeover of Egypt by the Roman Empire, various emperors wanted these enigmatic obelisks relocated to their capital cities for various reasons, including symbolizing the conquering of Egypt and even bringing some ancient Egyptian religious practices to the Romans. In around 10 BC, the Emperor Augustus conducted the first attempt of transporting a pair of obelisks erected by Tutmos III from Heliopolis in Egypt to Rome, over 2,000 kilometers away. These were the Flaminian obelisk, which weighs around 240 tons and stands 24 meters high, or 36.5 meters with the base and the cross that the Romans added. And also the obelisk of Montecito Rio, which is slightly smaller at 225 tons and around 22 meters high, or around 34 meters including the base and the globe that the Romans added. These obelisks were inscribed with commemorative writings to Emperor Augustus's conquest, emphasizing the power of the emperor, echoing the kingly value of the original structures. However, Augustus also maintained the original solar intention of the obelisks, dedicating them to the Roman sun god, Sol. With this move, Augustus incorporated a new Egyptian concept into Roman religion, while maintaining Roman religious practices around the sun. The Flaminian obelisk was erected in the Circus Maximus at the east end of the Spina, which when chariots would race around it would be like a symbol of planets orbiting the sun. The obelisk of Montecito Rio was placed in the Solarium Augusti and functioned as a gnomon, a monument that served as a large sundial. The Roman Emperor Constantius II had the obelisk of Theodosius moved from the great temple of Karnak to Alexandria to celebrate his 20 years on the throne in 357 AD. Then Theodosius I had it transported from Alexandria to Constantinople in 390 AD, where it is now known as the district of Fati in Istanbul, Turkey. The obelisk stood 30 meters or more originally, but was damaged either during transport or re-erection and now only stands about 20 meters without its base. The Lateran obelisk is the largest standing Egyptian obelisk moved by the Romans originally around 36 meters tall and weighing around 450 tons. It was from the reign of Tutmos III around 1500 BC and was completed by his grandson Tutmos IV. In 330 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine ordered the obelisk to be re-erected in the empire's capital Constantinople, but it remained in Egypt for 25 years until it was transported to Rome under Constantius II. He erected the obelisk in the center of the spina in the Circus Maximus, near the Flaminian obelisk that had been raised by Augustus centuries before. The Vatican obelisk was transported from Alexandria to Rome around 40 AD during the reign of Caligula. 
It was erected in the circus he had constructed near where the Vatican City is today. This obelisk's origins seem to be unknown as it has no hieroglyphs or inscriptions, but it stands around 25 meters tall and weighs around 350 tons. It remained there for over 1500 years until it was relocated to its current position in St. Peter's Square in 1586. So, how did the Romans transport these obelisks? Well, fortunately, we have descriptions, sketches and diagrams of ships and more showing us how this was achieved. This was an amazing feat of engineering that drew large crowds to witness thousands of years ago just as it would still today. The Roman author Pliny the Elder from the 1st century AD remarked that this undertaking was even more impressive than the obelisks themselves. He writes, The most difficult enterprise of all was the carriage of the obelisks by sea to Rome, in vessels that excited the greatest admiration. Indeed, the late Emperor Augustus consecrated the one that brought over the first obelisk as a lasting memorial of this marvellous undertaking in the docks of Putoli, but it was destroyed by fire. As to the one in which, by order of the Emperor Caligula, the other obelisk had been transported to Rome, after having been preserved for some years and looked upon as the most wonderful construction ever beheld upon the seas. It was brought to Ostia by order of the late Emperor Claudius, and towers of Putolian earth being first erected upon it. It was sunk for the construction of the harbour he was making there. The Romans would construct special ships to support the obelisk's weight, or they would construct barges for the obelisk, which would then be towed by ship manned by hundreds of people. Large Roman ships were known to be able to transport 200 tons plus, so they probably only used specialised barges for the largest obelisks they transported. Pliny also wrote regarding the transportation of an obelisk to Alexandria from Aswan, that an obelisk ship was loaded by digging a canal in the Nile especially for the purpose of loading the obelisk upon the ship. The ship would then have been placed in this canal with timbers lying across the canal, with their edges on both sides of its banks. The obelisk would then have been pulled onto these timbers, then when the yearly flood season came, it would have raised the ship so as to lift the obelisk from the timbers supporting it. The timbers would then have been removed and the obelisk ship would have completed its loading. Is this also the way the Egyptians loaded obelisks onto ships? The obelisks would be encased with wood and dragged from the barge to their destination using hundreds of people and animals, namely horses by the Romans. They would also utilise capstans and cranes as well as a tall scaffolding made specifically for erecting an obelisk when it reached its destination. The Romans are said to have used similar methods to the Egyptians before them, though the Romans had more refined techniques and equipment by then, plus a gigantic empire. But the Nile River and flood seasons were extremely important to the ancient Egyptians for transport, as it would allow for quarried stone to be transported up the Nile to various destinations. It's no coincidence that the ancient Egyptian empire and its cities were situated around the Nile River to where it meets the Mediterranean. We even have a carving of an ancient Egyptian obelisk ship from Hatshepsut's Valley Temple in Deir el-Bahari. She reigned during 1473 to 1458 BC, right around the time of Thutmose III, and we don't know exactly how long the Egyptians have been utilising ships for stone transport by this time, this is just the earliest example that we found, but it may have been since as early as some of the first dynasties. An inscription on the base of Hatshepsut's obelisk still standing at Karnak indicates that the work of cutting that particular monolith out of the quarry took around seven months. If they'd started a project in January, for example, they could aim to complete it ready for the Nile flooding season for transport around July to November time. Since the fall of Rome, many obelisks were knocked over or damaged by war and vandalism. Many have also been dug up and re-erected over the last 500 years, mostly by popes of the Renaissance and the Baroque periods. And a few obelisks have been gifted and relocated to other countries in the last couple of centuries too. In 1819, three obelisks were gifted to France, Great Britain and the USA, but the countries had to fund the transportation of the obelisks themselves. In 1830, one of the Luxor obelisks was transported to France. The Luxor obelisk stands around 23 metres tall and weighs around 250 tonnes, and the base was decorated with diagrams showing the machines used to move and erect the obelisk. It was pulled on a large barge towed by a paddle steamer called Sphinx. 
and it made the trip smoothly across the Mediterranean around the Atlantic to Paris. The other obelisk of the pier still stands in its original location in Luxor today. One of the obelisks commonly known as Cleopatra's Needles, weighing 240 tonnes, was eventually funded to be transported to the UK in 1877, and they almost lost the obelisk at sea. It was encased in a great iron cylinder made specifically for it, 28 metres long and 4.9 metres in diameter, which acted as a floating pontoon which was to be towed to London by the ship Olga. But in a storm in the Bay of Biscay, the Cleopatra began wildly rolling. The Olga sent out a rescue boat with six volunteers, but the boat capsized and all six crew were lost, and they're named today on the bronze plaque attached to the front of the Needles mounting stone. Captain Booth reported the Cleopatra abandoned and sinking, but instead she drifted in the bay until four days later she was found by Spanish trawlers, and then rescued by the Glasgow steamer. After repairs, it was finally towed to the Thames and she arrived on the 21st of January 1878 and was erected on the Victoria Embankment on the 12th of September later that year. Two years later, the USA transported the other of Cleopatra's needles from Egypt to New York City. A 3.7 metre square hole was cut in the starboard bow of the 1,367 tonne cargo ship SS Desaugue. Cannonballs were used as bearings to move the obelisk inside. When it arrived in the US, they built a track to slowly transport it the majority of the way by steam train, but also using a mixture of manpower and pulleys for different sections of the journey from the Hudson River. They also used 32 horses hitched in pairs to help transport the pedestal. It finally arrived on July the 20th, 1880. For the first time, an ancient Egyptian obelisk made it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to the US. So there we have it. That's how the Romans moved multi-hundred ton obelisks over 2,000 kilometers 2,000 years ago. How the Egyptians used similar, perhaps slightly less refined techniques before them, and how we've transported these huge monoliths in recent centuries. It is extremely hard to visualize as an individual how ancients transported huge weights like this, and it's why we have this whole ancient high technology argument going on today. But we found so much evidence pointing to how they achieved these feats, and none of them require any modern machinery or power, just human ingenuity and hundreds of people working together. So what do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it informative. Please like, share, subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care of yourselves out there.